Hello. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. On this episode, we're talking to a good friend of ours, Jason Wheat. So Jason is a producer, he's a writer, and he's also a voice actor on his own series called Starship Goldfish, which is available to see on YouTube. This conversation really kind of focused around, you know, you just got to get it out there and you got to be prepared for it to fail gonna fail a lot but if you love it you'll be able to push through the failures and get it to something that is successful right and then on top of that how long it really does take to get anything from concept into something somebody can see yeah. and his journey is at 10 years so 10 far years. the episode is available on our buzzsprout and on youtube you can watch this episode and if you are watching this episode well it's coming right up <laughs> i'd enjoy the show but yeah, but we were just talking about how, you know, like Vermont has that same type of feel to it as well as Duluth, where it, it kind of like time stops, especially in Vermont when you couldn't get cell phone reception oh, yeah, to right. save your life. Anyways, like there was no Internet in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, hadn't reached. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was, but yeah, it's uh, I kind of missed. Well, you know what? Actually, no, you know, I was going to say I missed Vermont when I was in Duluth, but Duluth had its own thing going on. It's yeah. really, I'm really say that I liked it there, but I did. I loved it there. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like that one place that you have like a uh, uh you know like a, a retreat of some yeah, sort right, right? Yeah, and you go yeah. there for like a few weeks maybe a month during that you know right around now you know not, not to insult duluth but i mean or manchester vermont but i don't know if i could see myself living there i can visit but cool. i don't know if i could live there like visiting for two weeks i might be bumping on that upper threshold of like <laughs> get me the fuck out of here i yeah. need to i need there to be traffic at 9 a.m 9 uh, 9 p.m i need there to be something going on after the sun <laughs> this goes doesn't down. suck <laughs> enough <laughs> I, I think places like that they serve their purpose you know like like maria bamford the comedian popped out of duluth you know like a like a champagne cork you know just <laughs> like get the fuck out of here it, it's a motivating factor for your hometown to suck i think yeah, right. There you go. Yeah, and then <laughs> not even just having something going on, but something to be open that you can order food from at oh, yeah, 2 right. in the morning. Yeah, which, right. We were so drunk one day, and we tried to order McDonald's, and the McDonald's was closed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. no, we, we close at at, uh, at at 10.30 here. Yeah, 10.30. What? Last calls at 9. <laughs> yeah, right. We're cleaning up at 10 from 10 to 10.30. Oh man, yeah. So, so we can get started. Um, we're in conversation with Jason Waite. Jason, we usually start off with you giving a little introduction about yourself. Tell us uh, who you are and what you do. Okay, um, my name is Jason Waite. I'm the writer, director, and uh, lead voice actor for a show called Starship Goldfish, which is a YouTube series. Um, uh, it was picked up by uh, the production studio that made Rick and Morty. Um, in uh, last year, um, Starburns Industries, nearly forgot the name, and uh, Big Jump in Canada before that. Um, those, yeah, when we're still pitching. Um, and just for my own self, I wrote the most recent season of Red vs. Blue, um, half of the season before it. Uh, I've been writing on uh, Freak Angels, which is an anime on Crunchyroll by, uh, based on a Warren Ellis graphic novel. and. Uh, yeah, that's it. That's it, isn't it? Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> that's being marginally impressive. Yeah, there. right. That, that's that's the end of my life there. It's, well, it's the hook, right? It's just like, well, fucking keep listening. Maybe he'll say something interesting. Spoiler, I don't. <laughs> so we got to... We got to well. Yeah, so we got to meet you at um, at Catalyst, but we had heard rumors about you even the year before from um, Sam Morrison who was, you know, like, he was just like, oh, yeah, there's this guy that does animation that I know that he was here last year, but he's not here this year. And we're like, okay, whatever, Sam. Um, you know, and then it, it when we got a chance to actually see your piece, it, it was one of those Starship Goldfish, which I'm sure I'm going to mess that up because it is a whole bunch of uh, syllables that sound alike smashed together, but I think that's part of the point. Um, <laughs> when we actually saw it, it was one of those pieces that, like, the, and it was the pilot episode that... Like you can actually feel like the theater just kind of calm, yeah, and actually pay attention, you know. Right. Yeah. And you don't get a lot of that in film festivals. There's a lot yeah. of times that you watch some stuff and you're like, "This is I can understand how they shot this. I know why they, you know, like, you yeah, know." And sure, a, it's funny, there was but a it's a certain not... level of refinement that was yeah. in there yeah. that was especially in an animation. Um, 
it's very difficult to get there without us big huge studio backing you right um so it was very impressive and then even the journey of how you got there is is impressive as well right um it was not a it was not a quick way to that pilot right from what right. i heard <laughs> <laughs> no it was something of a yeah around journey to get there 10 years actually uh, uh maybe a week or two weeks ago was the 10 year anniversary of starting the holy project. cow yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so and that goes to show you how like if let's say let's say that you all of a sudden this project gets picked up and gets brought on to um adult swim as an animation and then everybody's like oh wow look at this great new show where did it come from it came out of absolutely nowhere we can know that no it took right. a long time to get there <laughs> sure. but that's yeah that's the thing yeah. people don't see about success and you know the whole um platitude of the iceberg is what you don't see versus what you do see and it it's very true but yes it is a platitude Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there's no. Yeah, I mean, maybe there are straight lines if you're connected and you have money and your parents know to fucking school you in the industry from the age of 12, 13 until you're completely insufferable. Um, you know, I I got into this. I didn't. So <laughs> so when when the show was first being made, it was uh, it was called Sam Sweet Milk, and we had our first twenty minute episode that we we're making that was mostly animatic, and I created a small studio uh, with some friends office space uh, and I'm eternally grateful to that guy. Um, the animators turned around to me during, cause we made like a five minute segment that was animated in the middle of it to kind of like sell the idea. Yeah. And they were like, do you want it to be 720 or 1080? And I had no idea what that meant. <laughs> and that, that, that was the stage that I was fucking at with this thing is I just blundered into it as just an idiot being like, hey, I made a script, so obviously somebody has to produce that because I spent a long time on it. You know, and <laughs> like I'd saved um, a couple grand and was ready to just like blow it on it. And I brought in some really talented people and then they had no guidance and nobody showing them what, where to go and what to get. And you know, it ended up kind of experimental in places, which was good. Um, mm. But I think that's probably the only upside to doing things that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, was there anything specific that yeah you wanted me to go through that you thought would be interesting to your listeners? Yeah, well, definitely, definitely the process of you know like how, how did you end up doing? How did you end up yeah. writing a, an animation? And as you put it, kind of like you know blundering your way into it, like I, that that's got to be that's got to be an interesting story yeah. where you're just like you know what I had this idea I'm going to write it or somebody challenged you to do it. <laughs> um, I was writing, so I started writing a screenplay when I was at university, uh, which was set in the late 70s, and it was about this glam rock band fighting back the tide of punk as it rose up to sort of defeat glam. And I got really bored of writing it halfway through. I'd left uni, I'd rented a bed sit in South London to sit in and obsess, and I got really bored, halfway through it, really, really bored. And so I wrote something to remind myself that writing was fun. And that ended up, the most fun thing I could think of was this story of like a drunk, horny spaceman um, <laughs> who was like horribly entitled, basically living on their, you know, parents' money in this fancy spaceship, just going around causing problems. Um, right. And that became the concept of the show. You know, Ghostworth's original name, the, the robot character that is Sam's servant, who really serves as the main character now was Yokomoto 432 and he, he gets cut off by Sam he's like no you you, you see through like a ghost and you're my butler so you ghost were mm. um, and that's where that name came from and <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder if it just sounds strange now but there is a reason for it and yeah right so I wrote this thing and I was really happy with it and I was showing it to friends and I was you know I wouldn't shut up about it was the problem mm. until a friend of mine was just like, will you fucking shut up about it? Like, can you, like, I have some office space, you know, where you just, maybe you can just hire some animators and bring them in and, and do something. And I had no idea that that was a thing. You know, you don't think about possibilities when you're young. I was like 24 mm. and I, it never really crossed my mind to actually do the thing. I just wanted to talk about it forever. <laughs> um, and so, so that's what happened. I talked to some animator friends, um, and I said, where should I put an ad out? And so I put some on the Katsuka forums, the, the French animation um, site, and, and here and there and everywhere, I talked to some universities. I, I went to the, uh, the animation workshop in, in the north of Denmark. Uh, there was a, a production course there, and I got a, um, a free pass to go in and, and learn all of that. 
And so I got some connections from that and I was just hitting everybody up, wondering who I could bring in. And so I brought in a lead animator. I brought in um, two support animators, uh, a background artist, uh, storyboarder. And we made this fucking thing. Um, the storyboarder um, made a lot of uh, sort of like, well, he storyboarded the whole thing, but also select shots from that were taken by the lead artist of the animatic, Toby Clayton, and made into um, keyframes. Mm -hmm. And that really helped with the first episode. Um, they, the, the animation was based off of the keyframes. And so it had this lovely cleanness to the line quality. It, it sped the, the process up. Um, and so then we made this thing and that was 2013. We, you know, I, I, I had just kind of started dabbling in the dark art of PR via Reddit. Um, and it was all dark arts, really. There was Reddit. I was like going into, I was like finding ask Reddit threads that were like an hour, two hours old on their way up. And this is, you know, before Reddit was really a thing, to be honest. So, uh, but no, it was, it was a thing, but it wasn't like a big thing at that point. And mm. And I was looking for Ask Reddit threads that I could just about spin to be about the show. So someone would ask for a link. Um, and it was like, what's the nicest thing anyone's ever done for you? And I said, well, this actor, Kevin McNally, who plays Mr. Gibbs in the Pirates of the Caribbean films, who you know commands probably a huge uh, sum each time he plays uh, uh, that character, um, agreed to be in my show for free. And it's, you know, it's such a wonderful you know, compliment. And we got 2,000 Facebook page followers in an evening. Wow. Just off of the one of one comment on this thing. Um, fucking, I, I started, I was working at a social media agency from about 2014. So I started using software to build up our following, which was kind of a dead end in the end. But I think in the early days of Instagram, where it was like a wild west, it really helped to, to build the numbers that way. Um, but what I learned fairly quickly was all of these really desperate mes uh, methods of getting people in the fucking door uh, they weren't really amounting to engagement, which is really what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of dialed that back a lot and just started focusing on the work. Um, so we made the first episode. Um, it was just off of my own money and the, the stress of everybody working on the project. Um, and so we used that as an advertisement for the second episode. So we self-funded the first one. And then when it was released, it was released in tandem with an indie uh, no, Kickstarter campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and we set our goal at $44,000. We raised 33. Um, we came really close. In fact, it's yeah. the most we've ever raised for, for any of the projects so far. Um, uh, Natasha Allegri, um, one of the original um, uh, animators and uh, sorry, background artists. Or, was she story? No, she was storyboarder. She was, one of the, she was the lead storyboarder, I think, for Adventure Time and quite well known in her own right and lent a lot of her artistic style to the show. Mm -hmm. um, made fan art of us and was like, they put us on the BM Puppy Cat Kickstarter uh, newsletter, which gave us nine grand in a day, I think it was, wow. or across two days, just from the mention, you know, because because back then BM Puppy Cat just sort of exploded. It really touched, you know, it really did something personal for people, which is all you have to do, I think, in this business. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that failed, so we made another Kickstarter, that failed, so we made an Indiegogo and then raised 11 grand for the next episode, which was an animatic with elements of animation. The mistake I made there was not having a solid bit of animation in the middle of it that people could sort of, it, that I could share, that people could watch. What I did instead was I spread the animation all across the episode and it did mm. make the episode better, but it, it really harmed the sort of PR side of things. So I couldn't use it to raise a good amount of money the next time. Luckily, we didn't need to raise quite so much money the next time, although we did raise twice as much, um, because we earned a financial backer who uh, started putting some more money into the project, which is how ultimately when the pilot was released, the third episode looked as good as it did, in, in my opinion. Um, now, the third episode was a real Herculean effort, and I can really take no fucking uh, 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 ownership of how well it turned out, I feel, because everybody who worked on it was trying to set a career for themselves, you know? So I, I, what I did for every episode of it is I went to animation screenings for third year animators leaving university. Mm. And it was like shopping. I just kind of, you know, watch these things and, 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 you know, I, I'd, I'd sit through the screening. I'd make notes of, you know, who was animating the things that I liked and, and who was compositing the stuff that looked flashy, who was background artist on the stuff that looked like decadent and gorgeous. And then afterwards, with a head full of Adderall and a fistful of business cards, I was like, come on, we're going to fucking change the world. Nobody makes adult animation in the UK and it could be fucking, it could be you. Um, I found this uh, 
for the, for the pilot episode, I found this guy, uh, Rufus, Rufus Dexter, who's just a shit hot animator. Um, I loved his, his final project. And so he, he storyboarded um, most of the pilot. He um, animated most of the pilot or a lot of the pilot, um, composited some of it. And is just a really great creative mind in his own right. I really lucked out meeting the guy. And so then we made a pilot and it took a few years but we released it in 2018 um, to a certain amount of fanfare. Like we screened it some places, as you guys know. Mm -hmm. um, and it didn't explode immediately, which is what I had hoped for. Um, but I also knew that to be big on the internet, which is, I suppose, was going to be the goal, you have to be reliably putting out things all the time. Yeah. And I didn't care enough about anything but my project to do that. And certainly didn't really care much about talking about it. I just wanted to make the thing and let it consume my life, which was not a good PR move, really. Um, and to this day, you know, we, we made a YouTube channel and an Instagram in like, you know, a YouTube channel in 2013, Instagram uh, in like 2014. And we could have been pretty fucking big by now if we just made some things and posted yeah, things. Right. Right. So that, you know, I mean, if anybody's planned to go that route, I mean, I should be doing it now. It's like that old proverb, like when's yeah. the time to plant a tree, you know? Yeah. But I still can't fucking stomach it. It's just like, yeah. uh, it just, it feels like attention seeking. You have to be a certain kind of personality, I think. Well, well you know, it's, it's, it, it's one of those things where we've been doing that for a while with um, Instagram right now. We're posting every day for the podcast. You know, we post different things for the podcast. We split things up for the podcast and it does get kind of taxing, especially when you see that, the follower tick up only one maybe two a week maybe not at all yeah maybe one or two a week would be like hey man we're making progress right. Holy yeah cow. right uh, you know, you know one, <laughs> yeah. yeah right like one or two a month you know goes up but it it's a slow build people it's like in the it's like people think we have like sh like we always say we don't have short attention we have selective attention and it's like <laughs> it's like if if you're gonna post one thing a month who the hell is going to give you any, like, it's like, you're not even committed to this. Why would I be committed? <laughs> Why am I going to give my attention to you if you're not committed? And yeah. you have to be posting every day. And it's like one of the things with the podcast. It's like, I've been saying, I'm like, we might not even get a huge number of people listening until we've done a hundred episodes because at least then we have some credibility. Oh, well, they're going to keep up at this. You right, know, right. if we mm -hmm, did 30 mm -hmm. and stopped for our two months, people are going to be like, Oh, their last post was uh, three months ago. I bet. I guess they stopped doing it. I guess the money dried up, or I guess they're just not committed. I'm not going to be committed enough to listen to one of them. Right. You know, yeah. you need a thousand episodes to get a thousand people to listen. It's like one episode a person until all of a sudden you get millions of people listening every week. Right. It's that that, that weird proverbial cliff that you just jump off of at yeah, some point. Yeah. And well, it, what's it's, even crazier is that you're talking about how you didn't. You did well in the beginning to gain the followers, but you were lacking the interaction and the actual people like coming in and trying to find out more and and to interact with the content itself and actually fall in love with everything. And I think that you compared to a lot of people with short films that we've run into, you definitely did better than they have, which is saying something. You know, because you there was there was that level of um, and I know we can we can go back into, you know, and I, I Starburst, right? The people that did the animation for uh, Starburns, but close. Starburn, Starburn. That was close. All right. Um, <laughs> right. When they were talking to you, I remember I, I don't know if you put this out as a video or something, but I know that I watched it where they said that one of the reasons why they were interested in producing um, Starship Goldfish was because you had some sort of a following, right? There were people that were doing fan art, which I thought was hilarious with the one fan art you posted on your story where it's like, I'm covering up the nudity of it. And it was the top part. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I guess I have to see the rest of that picture. Cause holy cow, like that's usually not the route that they go. They usually go with the top part being nude. Um, so it was, I thought that was absolutely hilarious, but because you have that level of interaction, how important that actually was when it comes time to, hey, listen, we have interest in it. We have a fan base, right? There's people that are clamoring to see the first season. That's why you should pick me over somebody else who just has this idea, right? That they're like, oh, people could be interested. It's like, well, I actually have people that are interested. This is what they're saying. This is what they're doing. 
you know, and how important that that is. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I think shows like Has Been Hotel have done it really right. Um, it's about the it's that you can't do one thing wrong. You have to do everything at least average well, and you can't just excel in one thing. Uh, casting, you have to fill every voice in the thing with a voice that is reaching a lot of people um, and sharing the fact that they're in something that looks cool. You want to find the artists who want to have a following. Um, it, it's it's one of those, yeah, uh, I think back on what we could have been doing, and it. It's not really for us, I think, that root success. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think what you're talking about is kind of utilizing everyone else's audience to develop the audience of the actual thing because it's like the collaborative. It's like together we can create a lot more buzz than just one person trying to do it. Right. Like you should be using your your voice actor should be posting about the thing as much as, you know, not as much as you do, but as, as like you want them to be posting. Like I'm a part of something that's really cool. Check it out. You know, the artist that wants to get known for their background, for the storyboard work or the background of the, of the piece should be saying, Hey, look at this cool thing. I'm a part of, right. You know, mm -hmm. which is actually kind of what we've been running into a problem on the podcast is that we'll interview people that are like, wow, you guys are, like yeah. top notch of your of your industry, you know, like we had and I don't know if you met um, you know, Jeff Gomez, but we we had Jeff Gomez on the podcast. He was the, the guy met. Anyway, fantastic podcast. You should definitely mm -hmm. listen to it if you didn't get a chance to meet him, but um, you know, like he's posting about the podcast. He's like, "Yeah, I'm going to promote the shit out of this," right? Yeah. And it reflected in the number of people that watched it because yeah. nobody knows us; they know him, right? right. right. Or right, but right. the people that know us don't know him, so right. it's like we to get more people. It's like his audience and our audience can come together. But like, listen to this semi-intelligent conversation we had with a guy who's light years ahead and is redefining storytelling as an industry. Right. Yeah. Listen to him. Right. Um, but then you run into people, too, that like, you know, with the that would do podcast interviews with. And then it's like it's dead. And the reason why it was dead was because there wasn't, you know, like we we're putting out all this great content about like, hey, look how smart yeah. this guy is and or, or woman. And, and then, you know, it, we the, don't get any of that. The back. limited. It's like it's like they don't care enough to share their own stuff, which is kind of right. weird. Or they feel <laughs> like, maybe that not that they don't care, but they don't feel like it's worthy enough to, yeah, to, to share. I don't think it has not anything, worthy about the I, actual content, but they don't feel like they're worthy of that. I don't attention. think that that's either. I think it's just it's oversight because maybe some of the they just don't see the they don't see the value in sharing it on their side to get more people to listen to it. Hmm. You know, it's. Yeah. It's kind I, of, a, I, I, yeah. Finish the thought. Well, it's oddly selfish and then not selfish at the same time. Where it's like, <laughs> why? It's like I don't want to promote me because I'm I'm not gonna because I don't see the value in promoting this. And it's like, well, just promote it. You know, you said stuff that was very intelligent and very well thought. You know, just say it. You know, just promote it yourself. You know, right. it's yeah. It's, yeah that's have a little advice. You know. Just okay. fucking do the thing, say a thing, make any, make fucking something because the yeah. perfectionism while being the thing that will ultimately ensure success and a following and, and, you know, peer admiration in the industry, which is like really fucking important. If nobody, if you're not making anything because the thing you're making isn't perfect, then you're not going to make anything. And yeah. I couldn't really justify saying lower your standards to find success. I couldn't say that. I don't think, but it's like, you know, the, 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 it can't be overstated how important it is to audience share it to, yeah. to, you know, like you, you know, there's that, um, that, uh, there's an artist, a comic artist who makes these really intensely personal comics that do okay. And then he'll cross Mario with Halo and make a comic. And then suddenly there's a fucking million shares. And then he gets all these fans who are just like, make more Mario shit. And it's like, <laughs> Uh, cost, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think because what I'm in love with is the the format, the medium. I, it's it's telling story. It's being able to move people and 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 
have these these peaks you know i just want there to be like a moment of awe or a, a, a turn of phrase that has you repeat it in your head or you know these fucking moments that you're just you know you're tacking between and it does not translate to people being interested in the stuff you do it would make sense if i was working actually in the industry and making things and being a showrunner but in terms of like where we're at with the project like you know yeah and if you become like the, the industry is very easy to break into I've noticed because the people I've known who are very talented get absorbed up into it and float to the top where they belong. The industry is very, uh, very open to people leaving their hometowns um, and having really studied the craft and arriving at the front door with like, Hey, I'm ready. <laughs> the, you know, it, 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 and it's, and it sounds pie in the sky, but it's really, really true. The amount of conversations I've had with people actually in the industry of making cartoons, you know, for like money, money, um, they're always looking for people. They're always, it's just yeah. like, you know, we can't fucking find an editor. And it's like, you can't find it. It's like, no, no, we can find <laughs> editors, but we can't find the editor, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's about, and, you know, it's also like, I think people don't want to build their personal brand either on those platforms. What so is actually really important because like, um, the only way you're going to get landed in a job especially in this industry is if you are the right person. So you have to build that brand and be, be the right person, you know, and, and it's, it's like, you have to show growth, you know, it's like, yes, your first couple of posts will suck, but you know how no one's going to see it anyway, because it sucks. You know, <laughs> it's like you're putting it out there because you're afraid you're going to get judged by the 200 followers you have. And right. they're not going to, they don't give a shit. If oh, anyone, yeah. you might get more followers because they're like, hey, look at this guy. He's posting crap. I'm a little better than him. And then all of a sudden you start getting better because you're actually showing stuff and you're actively getting better. Right. Exactly. People really admire somebody doing something. And yeah. that's what's missing. It's not even the bravery or the you know, self-effacing nature of releasing stuff that's imperfect. It's just being seen to do something it's like an umbrella people want to come and stand under like oh great something's fucking no yeah. this is the spot to be um and i i you know whenever i collaborate with people i'm looking for that for somebody fucking doing something you know um actually no that's not necessarily hard and fast i would say that equally i look for people who are really talented who aren't doing anything because it's like a <laughs> beautiful ship in the harbor you know <laughs> yeah right <laughs> right hasn't had the bottle of champagne against the yeah, hull just yet yeah. but it's ready to fly <laughs> right, exactly. exactly yeah yeah um but i suppose um well, I you know i mean i'm i've certainly had a you know i don't know if it's a unique path in this thing um but it's certainly one that i could have done better and i know now how i could have done it better so I suppose for anybody who's listening to the podcast who is looking to go the path of making their own thing, um, here's some things that might make it a little bit easier. Uh, I'm not an animator. Uh, I don't know how to animate. I'm, I haven't really drawn anything properly since I was a teenager. Um, I found people who were talented and I just sold them on the idea of the thing that I was making because I really believed in it. Um, if you tell a story, uh, you'll put yourself into it without meaning to. And even if you try not to, you'll just do that extra hard somehow. Uh, all the characters are going to be little fragments of you. All of their problems are going to be weird analogs of the things in your own life because you only write what you understand. Mm -hmm. If you start writing, a, I don't know, you, you pick a, a female character that maybe you haven't interacted with before and you're just plumbing your memory of television and movies and books... But if you can move that character over to somebody in your own life, uh, a relative or a friend, suddenly they become very, very easy uh, to write. And so the more personal the thing feels to you, the more anima you'll have to get the thing fucking done, the more s mental voltage you'll have to, to weather how much it's going to fail before it gets to where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, it's just cost and avoiding ridiculous spends, and that's money and time. 
um, for the pilot when we made it. I, you know, I, I hired people out of university, which really helped. Um, and that it was a wonderful cast that I, you know, of people that I, I had come in to work on it. There was, there was, um, Andy Stevens, who was an animator, Mateusz Borkowski, who's a shit hot compositor. Um, we, uh, we were managed and there's a better word for that in the industry and I can't produced, <laughs> um, um, <laughs> It's <laughs> a better word for that. What, what do they do? <laughs> um, and and it came out really well as a result. We we, we partnered with a, a local university, and they allowed us to use their resources, all of their computer setup, and and ridiculous amount of software and storage that they had in exchange for our animators teaching a class um, during the summer and teaching mm. people how to use the software that we were using. Um, there were workarounds to get there. The, the, the actors who I found for it were either volunteering their time or they were quite new to animation. And, it, and you can get that to work so long as you listen to enough um, auditions. It, mm. you know, there's no shortage of actors out there, but if you listen to enough of them, you'll find one that's, that really works. Um, one thing that Rick and Morty got really, really right is that every fucking voice actor in it is just stellar. And it shows that Justin Roiland is sort of co-directing the thing because he's a voice actor and he knows that it's it's lilt, it's intonation, it's delivery. It, you can make something that's not funny, very, very funny, just by the way that you say it in a certain situation. And sure. you know, that, that, that tracks to these, to these shows. Yeah, I suppose knowing, knowing the thing, knowing the audio, because audio is half of what's happening when you're watching an episode of something. You don't think about it really when you get into it. Oh, is my audio quality going to be, need yeah, to be right. really good? Are the sound effects going to need to be unique? Are the, are the, is there going to have to be short gaps between it, different characters speaking so that it feels interesting because there's so little visual information when you're looking at blank drawn faces? You know, All of these things you have to keep in mind. It's the pacing, it's the music, it's the sound effects, it's the fucking, you know, the structure of the thing. It's giving people a, a rest between acts to, to really feel like they're processing what's happening and that they've got breathing space and, and it's the color and, and, you know, the line quality, all of these things together because you will be judged on your lowest point and not your highest point. And it doesn't sure. matter how cool you've done something. Mm. It's the fucking shit audio or that you used, I don't know, um, uh, Comic Sans as the font or something. You know? <laughs> yeah, it, and it's it's tough. You have to, like, for, for a while, I was out of love with the project, and that will happen um, when it when the world disappoints you, not the project, when the world disappoints you enough in not accepting this child and... That does happen, and you have to be ready for that as well. Um, it's it sucks a lot of the time. It's just such a fucking struggle, and you wonder why the hell you're doing it. And you have to you have to remind yourself periodically why you're doing it, and it's because you love it. You fucking there there are these moments when you're writing, or these moments in the studio where everything just seems to line up perfectly. Or these moments, and that's what you're doing it for. It's right. so easy to forget, but that's. It's the only thing that's going to keep a carrot dangling in front of your face until you actually get somewhere, you know? Yeah. It's very much of a, a relationship. What you just described is a relationship. And you've been in a 10-year yeah, committed relationship. My and problem. there's going to be highs and lows with that, <laughs> right? I think what you I, you also said something that was really interesting is just like how much passion you have it will help you weather to how many times it's going to fail before it succeeds. And I think that's... I think that's true with everything. It's going to fail. Um, one of the one of my mentors said when uh, for screenwriting, like actually submitting into screenwriting competition, she said she was like she's like I want to get rejected a hundred times. I got close, but I never got rejected a hundred times. She's like I got to sixty six times submitting a different scripts just getting rejected but i've never gotten to a hundred times and i just want to get to a hundred times of getting rejected and mm -hmm. i think that's a that's interesting even from her perspective as a working writer she's like yeah i get rejected all the time it doesn't it's nothing because the industry is very subjective mm -hmm. also you're just gonna it's gonna happen not everybody's i remember the first time i was in um i was at uh, itv fest i was I had this, the, the Jacob Kruger um, studio had this little pitch party. And so I was pitching the script to everyone and I got a lot of good reviews from my pitch. And then we went to the main party for, you know, the awards ceremony and not everyone that was important went into their awards. And I wasn't 
going to get an award, so I just stayed back in the cocktail area with all the other people. And I asked this one lady, because she was a producer, I was like, could you let my, can I, can I pitch for you? Because I was just learning this whole thing. She's like, oh, yeah, I guess, go ahead. And so I started my pitch, and she's like, can I stop you right there? Um, is this, is your, and she just started to talk about all these things that's like I already knew and she was talking about like how your villain has to be dynamic he can't just be a villain I'm like what do you like I don't know that like I'm here and I don't know that like you think I'm gonna have the twirling mustache villain I'm like no I have a very complex idea for that man who is the villain in this like I mean to tell me that your villain has to be sort of or your antagonist has to be sympathetic is Mm -hmm. like it's like so yeah, you're gonna get a bunch of yahoos. You're gonna get failures. Like that was a failure on my part, even tra- walking up to her. I knew from her body language she wasn't gonna give me the time of day, <laughs> but I went up and tried. And you know, you're gonna get. And then this other guy said to, to me, this other guy, um, he's like, I'm like, hey, can I pitch for you? I just learned how to do it. And he's like, he's like, honestly, I have too many in, in more important things to listen to here. I'm like, I'm like, whoa, all right, okay. <laughs> But you know what? You're going to meet good people that really want to hear what you have to say. Like I met this one guy. He took me aside, sat with me, and he just said, hey, these are the things that I think you should touch on. Mm-hmm. I'm not in. I'm not looking for this kind of project, but these are some things you might want to think about when you're pitching to someone. And I was like, thank you so much for taking your time to, you know, teach me and guide me. You know, yeah. you're going to fail. It's It's inevitable. And if you love it, you're going to grind it, you know. As mm-hmm. entrepreneurs, we fail all the time, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, if you're okay with the fact that you're going to fail, then you're going to win too. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I think that there are certain, like, it's almost psychopathic the way that you have to continuously do the thing. It's just like, no, I deserve this. <laughs> mm. <laughs> like, because it, it doesn't make sense. It's just like, well, I did it and I failed. Time to do it again. Like you can do that a few times, but a hundred, yeah, it feels like pushing it a little bit. Because uh, I had, you know, you, when you're starting out, you're full of confidence and you have no idea how much you suck or why. Right? Like I fucking sucked. I still suck now, is my, my own opinion, but I'm starting to notice the way. So I'm like leaning that way. Like, okay, well, I'll just, <laughs> you know, workshop that. But you I'll don't know this. if you if you if you've written something and it's your first project, it sucks. That sucks. I'm sorry, whoever you are, that sucks. You think you've made it sucks? It, it's awful. You you've made something awful and you've birthed it into the world and it's a nightmare and nobody should look at it. <laughs> but you did create it, and that's important because next you make another one and it totally sounds like you're saying it. It sounds insane, but you just keep doing it. And you keep releasing them and you keep showing people and you keep talking about it. You keep saving up and working and, and planning. And sometimes you take a two year break as I have the last two years and you, you know, you're not working on your own thing anymore. You're doing work for other people's stories and it's not as satisfying, um, but it's really, really good experience. That's off topic. I'm just wondering now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, you know, you just have to, I mean, I, I'm quite like, negative about it really i'm like you have to really hate your work you have to you have to just absolutely hate your work into shape you 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 make it and then on your second reading none of the jokes will be funny anymore but they'll be like a little funny and then the third reading they'll completely stop being funny and you can only keep the jokes in that are going to be funny still on the fifth reading and you're excited for people to see them you know so you turf that bit out and it's like actually this relates to the whole social media posting thing it's like making something every day but you, uh, and this is a line from the anime One Punch Man, every blow of your combo must be delivered with the intent to kill. Mm. Every fucking thing you do has to be like fucking, uh, and you focus and you put the work in and you make it, you know, it's just like, well, not everything you make can be good. And it's like, that's true, but you should never release one unless you think it is. Sure. You know, people will, you know, I, I've had people who have, refused to watch the pilot because they saw a black and white animatic and they were like, nah, whatever. Mm. You know, you, you, you sometimes you do have a, a first yeah. impression to make. I don't know. It's, yeah. it's a, I don't know. The, the, the industry holds all the cards. They have all the resources. They have all the talent. 
it's like an advertising agency and you're a, you're like making modern art, you know, and then you look at some ad for an app and it's like gorgeous and the way that everything is, you know, the way all the lines work together and, and it has this depth to it and it feels harmonic. And it's because never in the history of art has so much resources been used up by these, you know, corporate entities who just fucking funnel it that way. So we're fighting against this, this massive thing and people are so fed you know they're like they've, they've been fed on such a rich diet of perfect shit that when you make something and it has these frayed bits those frayed bits have to be really charming otherwise they're going to turn off right like you know it has to have the warmth of floor rather than the appearance of a broken car like yeah yeah, yeah there are a few things i want to touch on from that because you you briefly spoke and said it was off topic but working on other people's projects really does help you work on your own projects and that's from uh you know uh actual gaining certain experience of like well i'm not gonna do what that producer that that's for sure jesus that was a nightmare all Mm. the way down to networking right and finding more people to talk to and you're you're just kind of moving up right maybe the executive producer's on set one day and you're like hey you know, you start a good rapport with a guy, you grab a beer with him, you build some sort of a relationship. Then all of a sudden he's like, hey, what project are you working on? And then boom, that's how that happens, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's really important. And then the also the idea of just having, you know, a, a good first impression. But, you know, like everything that you put out has to be one of those that for, for me, for the podcast, every segment that I put out, I want it to be like, and this is the one that everybody's going to be like, that was hilarious. Yeah, Mm -hmm. that was so hilarious that, you know, all of a sudden they share, they share, they share, they share. And I got a thousand new subscribers, right? Right. Or a thousand views on that video, right? Right. That's the way that I have to look at it, even though I know for the most part, like we did one with um, previous Caitlin McAllister where I misspoke and I said faster, farter (laughs) rather than faster, smarter, right? And I was like, that's going to be the one that we're going to put out on Wednesday. That's the one that's going to kind of solidify the whole conversation. It was a great thing about venture capital, entrepreneurship, right? Everybody should listen to it. Um, But I'm like, that's the one that people are going to be like, oh, these guys, yes, it's informational. All the stuff that we do, right? We have a lot of, we put a lot of our heart and soul in these conversations, but we make fun of ourselves too. And we have a lot of fun and it's entertaining throughout the entire hour, right? That we have this, and this is the one that's going to make it. Did it work? Not really. Yeah. (laughs) Not really. But I had that intent and everything that we put out, there's that intent that somebody's going to see it and be like, yep, this is, this is the part. This is the one that they're going to be able to really connect with. Yeah. yeah, it's like you were saying that it that there has to be this effortless magnificence to it, you know? It's like, I don't know if you've noticed this in media, but if something is good, but it felt like it wasn't trying, mm-hmm. that's so, such a draw. And to be, to be uh, you know, to, to, to put personality through, to push it through the mesh of the, of, of the media that you're releasing, it feels as though you 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 have to have this seeming of somebody or something or 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 or, or, a, or a feeling. It's like you know confidence, obviously, um, but really throughout all of this stuff, you're just selling yourself. And from television and film and documentary, people are really good at sniffing out when you're kind of faking it. And mm-hmm. I still, you know, I'm faking it right now. I don't think I can drop the mask. You know, it's just how information is pushed out. You know. Um, but to be trustworthy and for people to just buy it that, you know, you're fucking doing a thing and you care about it. And especially in the, the industry that you guys are, you know, if you, if you it, it's your personality that you're selling, right? Yeah. You know, it, yeah, it can't, there's so many, I don't know, components to finding success in all of this. And it's that you've worked on the talent of the thing, you know, and making the thing industry standard fit for human consumption make it do things that other people haven't before I, I identifying what your strengths are and then really leaning into those for the time being. Um, but then it's also your own personality and it's also your work ethic. And I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard before, obviously, but, but yeah, there's so much and they're, and they're very disparate talents. They're totally different from each other to be talented. Uh, the re- the most talented people I know are terrible at self promotion, terrible at like conforming. They work they make the work yeah. they make to industry standards, even just down to the formatting. Um, mm. But you have to 
you have to be totally rare and, and spontaneous while also being in lockstep with what people expect you to be doing, weirdly. And you have to be making things people have seen before, but in ways that they haven't seen it before. You know, yeah. these subtypes, these, yeah. these things that are, uh, yeah, you know, subcultural, you know, that, that they are diversions from the norm, but they're still the norm. They're, they're variations on it. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot to it. And they're not, th- you know, think- being really like, sorry. No, if you were, you're, you're pontificating about something. You could finish your thought there. <laughs> but you, you, weren't even, really you weren't even, you weren't even looking at the, at the laptop. You were like looking up to the heavens. Yeah, I want right. to know, about I want to know, to I want to know what else you're going to say there. <laughs> what, what, what was that? And, I fucking forgot what I was going to say. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, what I was going to say is a little bit less, um, uh, probably I'm not going to, I'm not going to go to the muse, um, but I think it all starts, everything you said of what you need and how you need to do it, it all comes from consistently pushing out something. Because the only way you're going to know what people are looking for and what they haven't seen is if you're actively in that conversation. And the only way you can actively be in that conversation on social media is by pushing out content and commenting on things that you are similar to things you've pushed out. I mean, Instagram makes it very easy to figure out what conversations you want to be in. You click the hashtags and you see what is getting posted in that hashtag. You could read the comments of what people are commenting on that thing that on that specific hashtag, you know what that audience is talking about. And yes, it is a deep dive into something that will consume your life. Um, But again, it's, that's, that's the hard work that you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that you'll find exactly what someone is looking for and you'll know exactly what they haven't seen in that space or you even know what they're looking for that they haven't seen that's exactly what i said right but i said that a little differently and you said it backwards but that's good though. okay like, yeah hmm. right, there you go yeah, yeah. Right. process it easier yeah it, yeah um you you have to work on you know well, i mean i mean you know I, we, we're talking about you know this multifaceted approach but i think about artists who have found real esteem um, that have earned their voice in the industry without ever really entering it. You know, um, these artists who have, have just fucking worked on their craft, who have lived on very little to study, to practice, to make this thing perfect. I was, I was reading um, an interview with the writer of a show called Giri Hadji, which is on Netflix, which is absolutely wonderful. He was saying that the, um, oh wait, no, it wasn't it. It was Nick Pizzolato who wrote the, um, uh, uh, true, true, detective. true detective yeah um and he was saying if you want to get into the industry and it really just saying the same things i said earlier because i have no original thoughts <laughs> um he was saying if you if you want to get into this industry there is space for everybody who's talented and what you have to do is make some money put it aside find a really low rent living situation um live on what you have to do what you got to do but study the craft, sit down there, break things down, look at the scripts, look at the way things work. When something feels right, look at why, deconstruct it, you know. I was watching yesterday, um, Thundercat, the uh, the musician, was breaking down his favorite bass lines. And he really, it wasn't just like, yeah, this is good, it's funky. It's like, okay, look what they did with the harmonics of this song. So when he was like labeling all the individual parts of how everything worked together and, and then it moves into this, which of course answers the question that the bass is asking. And it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, because there is some really high level, I don't want to call it mathematics, but there is theory going on. And everybody, it, it's like, you know, you you learn the physics of the world by being in it. Somebody throws a ball at you, you know when it's going to fucking dip, but you don't know why. You don't know the maths of it. And in the same way as an audience member watching something, and it, when it makes sense, it makes total sense. And when it doesn't, it really doesn't. But you couldn't tell them why. You couldn't tell yeah. them why it sucked. Yeah, that's, um, and so yeah, you that's, just that's have a to. Great, yeah, right. Yeah. That's a great perspective on it because you're you're right. I mean, that there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of content out there that that maybe you'll watch and whether it's an animation or whether it's a, a film or, or a series where you're like, yeah, I get what you're going for there, but it just didn't work. Right. And I yeah. think that it, it's incumbent on you if you do have that opinion. Right. Or you do 
you're, well, you're not feeling it, then it's like, okay, but why? Yeah. Right? Think, why isn't that working? Was it because of the script? Was it because of the shot or because it was the editing was just, you know, awful? Or was it because of and being able to break that stuff down, it just kind yeah. of Right, if, if reestablishes the knowledge that you have, right, right, going in and being just, able to perfect yeah, just your own to, work. Just to clarify, not every audience member has to do that, but if you are in the industry, yeah. right, if you're, if yeah, right, if you're trying industry, to be in the industry, if you're, well, if you're like, if you want to be a master of a certain craft, then yes, you have to ask those questions to understand why this works versus why that doesn't work. Right. Um, I do like the idea of once you're in the physics of it. Once you know the rules of that world, and that goes back to immersing yourself in the conversation as well. Um, once you understand what people are looking for, you can definitely serve that need. Yeah. Yeah, you, you learn the rules so you know how to break them in ways that are interesting. Yeah, um, right. There you go. Right. And, That's you know, you, 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 I, I think what really helps is the scene that you're in, the group of people that you choose to, to be around. That there is an exchange of information, there's a challenge there. Everybody's invested in the same way. They are seeking out sources of information and sharing them with the group. Um, there was a concept I think put forward by Brian Eno where when he was called a genius, he refuted it. He said, no, 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 I was just part of a scene that, that delivered me. I couldn't have done any of the things I wanted to without the apparatus, the, the instruments are all, you know, of, of, of marketing and of, of publicity, but also the cafes and the pubs that that, that, that we had hung out in and, and talked and drank. And, and he called it seniors rather than genius. Mm. And it's the seniors that you want to, that, that will deliver really interesting things because they're almost always born of cooperation. Um, yeah. With the internet, the scene can be smaller. It can be a discord group. Um, yeah. But it's seeking out that seniors and and finding peers who you respect and who respect you and who are interested in what you have to say and who say interesting things. And I think if you get into this industry, you may not be very interested in what other people have to say as a rule, um, because it's just like, look at me, look at this thing I've made, pay attention to me, you know. Right. And there's, you know, it's unavoidable and it's really cringeworthy and embarrassing but there had to be some reason that you made the thing and it's not just an exploration of story or, oh, wouldn't it be nice to, you know, to, to entertain yourself. And actually to dial that back a little bit, Dan Harmon said that if you're on a, a, a desert island and you made a show on that island out of coconuts um, and you made it for yourself, that is the quality of show you want to be making. You want it to, to be such a good idea, you would make it on a desert island with coconuts. Hmm. You, and if you right. make, and as you guys know, if you make it yourself, it has to be a really good fucking idea. If you're just trying to sell to pitch the idea, it's never going to get picked up. You know, if you would, if you have an idea that you go out and pitch that you would never make yourself, that you don't care enough about to make yourself, that's the fucking litmus test, man. You know, yeah. drop the idea, get rid of it, yeah. um, because you would let it kill you. It would be an idea that you would like so much that you would spend ten years of your life chasing that first whiff of you know doing something. Right. Absolutely. 100% the not chasing, not chasing what you think people want. I, it, it's a balance, right? Because yeah, right. you're like, we got, you, know, you have this great like, idea and you're like, this is what we're really passionate yeah, about. Right. But then you kind of have to match it to what, you know, like say a producer comes and wants to produce something, right? Say, like, you know, the web series that we have um, that we didn't get to produce because of COVID-19 and now it's on, you know, in a, in a never ending cycle. Right. And we've mentioned it to a few people, like at the especially at um, Catalyst, um, you know, we're like, aha, next next year. Here we are. You know, still don't have it done. But, um, you know, but you also have to leave room for people like producers that want to come in and, and change certain things about it and not be so married to it. But what you definitely don't want to do. Right. And uh, Richard Bodo says uh, said this in a CEO of uh stage 32 right it's like nobody wants like they were like um people are asking them if they wanted um or they're writing new uh coronavirus or oh, like yeah, pandemic right. screenplays and he's like nobody wants to watch that it's right. like what do you think that just because everybody's going through it i mean nobody wants we're right. experiencing we don't want to watch that it's yeah, like right. don't try to right. predict where the industry is going to go it's like right yeah. do something that you actually want to do you know right like if it was honestly something that you were passionate about then it's going to actually show in the in like but no one's going to want a pandemic um 
No one wants. You know what? But and then everybody to everyone. Eleven o'clock, or it's it's noon here, and we're drinking. Uh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> it's Friday. Um, no, I haven't had any booze today. I don't know. My my tongue didn't want to. My lips and my tongue didn't want to cooperate with my mind. Um, <clears throat> but to the same effect, people are saying that. Well, well you know, contagion. Um, uh, 2012 all those stupid movies about natural disasters and disasters are all like you know on netflix um i was gonna say instagram netflix um hulu amazon they're all getting like that's where all everyone's watching everyone's watching those movies and it's like yeah but no one's gonna want to watch it after <laughs> once we all get out of there you best believe no one's gonna want to go to coming to a theater near you covid19 yeah right it's like why would I want to go? I'm going to go watch that movie. No, I'm going to go watch um, Tom Hanks. I don't know. Argue with a chimp for five hours. For five <laughs> hours? Wow. The new the new movie with Tom that. Hanks. I just you know, and the chimp is actually oddly enough played by Nick Cage. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, there you go. Uh, no CGI needed. They're just going to make. They're just going to have him naked running around. Not a, yeah, not even a suit. You wouldn't even put a voice on. I'd actually. I would pay to see that. Yeah, yeah. A condensed five hours. Uh, like well, the, the director's hours, cut. Yeah. Jack's director's cut is five hours, but the actual it'll be like you know, like a two-hour thing, ninety minutes maybe. I don't know what he escapes from the zoo. I'm trying to actually formulate this movie. <laughs> no, now. sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, it's like COVID. COVID is like it, you know, it's 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 a, it's disease that's like down pretty touch pretty much everyone. Um, it mostly affects the elderly, but not strictly. Um, it's really, you know, messing us up and we don't like talking about it. It's like cancer. Would you be making a ton of movies about cancer? It's like, well, hey, yeah, you go into the fucking studio and you're just like, hey, guys, I know we've all got this shared cultural experience of having a big C. Uh, I've written this script that just like, you know, really explores it. I've made a disaster movie of cancer. <laughs> like, fucking what? I don't know. Yeah, it's just like, uh, yeah, it's so fucking mundane. Yeah. I, mm, like when they they would tell when I was first starting out, you know, I go to these production meetings. It's just like, hey, don't think about your idea too much. Don't make it too fully formed because some dickhead exec somewhere will have some pet idea, like a giant robot spider. He's not been able to fucking elbow in the like, fucking shoehorn into anything, so he's going to put it into your show. Uh, no, no. The only things worth watching are whole artifacts that came from one or two or three people. Um, you know, just. In the industry, they are starting to know a bit better. You know, they 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 pick a talent, they kind of vet them a little bit, make sure they're doing okay, and then they get the fuck out of the way and they yeah. allow someone to just make thing, especially with miniseries, uh, but less so in general. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, well, you know, you just look at the how the industry is changing in terms of like writers are now getting like contracts, like NFL stars. You know, like um. The Duffer Brothers just signed a five-year, nine-figure deal with Netflix, and they all and like the stipulations are like, like you got to make it's like three five shows years. It's like they have any idea that they have in five years is like Netflix's idea, and you know they produce they have to produce two shows or start producing two shows, and it's like it's like that's where the industry is going for writers, right? Uh -huh. um, yeah, if you know your shit and yeah. you know what people want and you can play to the genre at first and then later on start making it a bit more of your own thing. And there's a route. There is a series. It's like Mario. There's a fucking series of control buttons that you put in in the right order at the right time and you'll you'll complete the game. You know, it's just knowing what they are. Right. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting if we start seeing like, you know, um, series or uh, streaming service draft nights and oh, yeah, there are right. trades going on yeah, you know you have the trading. top draft picks you know it's like well there it's between jason Waite going first or it's frank and jack conrath going first in the new draft and oh, netflix right. has number one because they were the lowest on the views right yeah right? Lowest, they had lowest, lowest views viewing numbers <laughs> <laughs> it's like which way are they going to go well they're really looking at animation right now so we're thinking it's going to go to and then but, they pick yeah, right. like some random person yeah, like right. But you, but you can't really you can't really um, underestimate Amazon's deep pockets. Right, they could trade up in the draft. <laughs> right, 
They just signed, you know, they just signed, uh, you know, the Lucas Brothers for MIA, for right, yeah, ten million dollars yeah. for five years. It might be ten million dollars for five years. Come on, let's bunt that up. Oh, it's bunt Amazon. It up, all right. It's like ten billion dollars. <laughs> ten billion dollars for, for five years. years, and they're looking off offshore um, or um, get rid of most of that contract in a trade for oh, some draft yeah, right. pick. There you go. It'd be fun. Um, I, and, and I think I it's a like, well overdue. <laughs> yeah, right. I feel like, but that's kind of going back to the old studio system where the studio kind of owns you. Um, mm, yeah. Everything goes up and it comes back. Yeah. It and goes think, away well, and it know, comes back. It's just like so one we're of those just things going where, into that new phase. Yeah. I feel like, feel like Netflix has really been the one company that's been like buying contracts for writers. Like even the guy from, um, what's the guy's name? He did American Horror Story. And all oh, that yeah. he he's on the hook for five years for three hundred million, um, <laughs> yeah, for Netflix. Wow. So so what? Because I thought on average a writer earned like five hundred bucks a year, but that yeah, right. <laughs> average up. I think no, right there, but so now it's more like a thousand bucks a year. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, is the average for every guy. writer. Yeah, man. right. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> what a great industry. There's such a there's that that split of yeah. just like where you start and then what. You know, like it's like where you get started to get taken seriously, and that jump in cash is yeah. just crazy. <laughs> I want to be a hundred percent sure I'm right with that, but I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna look that up so that I don't sound like a total asshole. Yeah, eight fig- nine figures is a lot. That's yeah, zero zero I'm zero. I'm pretty sure that zero, it was zero. it was something that crazy though. Was yeah. it? Maybe not a half a billion dollars. I mean that you're, you know, Netflix. I don't know how into uh, American football you are, but one guy just signed a half a half a billion dollar contract for 10 years oh my god and there's so much money in the nfl so that sounds more realistic than something for 300 million dollars for five years that's wild um they have signed a contract oh yeah netflix overpays again nine figure deal for stranger thing bros okay so, yeah. uh, so they have a nine that's figures. a wonderful success story though the the um Montauk, I believe it was called, the original iteration of Stranger Things that went through 30, 35 hands before it finally, you know, got somewhere years later. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, good for them, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 But now good they baby. just need to, you know, pay that forward, you know. They have nine <laughs> figures. They can give one figure away, can't they? Pay that here, fucking. <laughs> uh, so this has been a great conversation, Jason. Um we usually end off with um, some words of wisdom, something that you know we can, uh, our listeners can kind of take away from. I mean, just from the talk conversation. To the yeah, right. Just talk if to you the could recreate yeah. that and and get that back, that'd probably be exactly what it was. Um, it's gonna sound horribly unhealthy, um, and it may be wrong, uh, but your spare time is for spending, and spend it well. That's what I'd say. Well, that's very succinct. Yeah. Normally right. people ramble in words of wisdom. Yeah, right. Oh, and they go off. I, I did that already. Say, yeah. <laughs> we got all the rambling out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> the whole podcast. The, whole the rest podcast. of it was all rambling. We are right. <laughs> Everybody's just going to skip to. Yeah, right. You know. <laughs> to this part. Uh, to an hour in and they'll be like, all right, that, that's what I need to take out of it. Uh, <laughs> well, listen, hopefully soon we'll be able to see each other in person again because, I mean, we did have uh, a great time. And it was a lot of fun and, you know, nothing better than having some a whole bunch of really great people cooped up once again in Duluth, which is the tiniest little big city you'll ever run into. Mm. And you're just like, all right, yeah, all right, we'll see you later, Jason. And I'm like, oh, I'll probably run into him in like three hours yeah. and he'll be, you know, like just at some random place yeah. and we'll be walking around and we'll hook up again and then and have a grand old time, which is always a lot of fun. You are I and I said this to a lot of people, too, when we came back. Um, one of the wittiest people I've ever run into. Your wit is unbelievable. It's fantastic. Accent, it's always honestly. funny. If I had a Boston, Boston accent, you wouldn't be saying that at all. Yeah, oh, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Maybe it's the British accent maybe, yeah. totally. It does a lot of work. It does a lot of lead work. I recommend yeah. it. You can be yeah. born in England, <laughs> yeah. you can do it. Because it does sound. Everything does sound a little bit passive aggressive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like where where's the store, Jason? It's over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh i'm so sorry it's cultural you know it's cultural references you can't you can't blame me for no no you okay. can blame me for that i'm at two well, super I mean, yeah, yeah i'm like that sorry sorry <laughs> even you there, to... even that sounded a little passive aggressive i'm sorry i'm sorry i insulted your wit i'm sorry <laughs> very sorry you dumb american 
<laughs> I got you. Yeah, right. Um, oh, I had I had such a lovely time. This was really good. It was good to see you guys again as well. Awesome. And yeah, like you're saying, you know, it'd be good to go to Catalyst. And it, it has this weird talent, that town, or just the festival, really, even. Yeah. Of just if you go on a, you know, if you go on a short two minute walk, you'll see like eight or nine people that you know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. It's our cheers. It's our cheers. <laughs> <laughs> the lovely creative Dude. little polycule. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. All right. All right. Great. Well, well, you know, we'll be paying attention to, uh, you know, new updates about what you're doing and any way that we can help and support you. Just let us know. Um, you, you got us here. So, um, yeah. And hopefully we'll be able to get to Europe at some point. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be nice. We'll do a little tour and uh, then depending on where you're living. Cause you just, you, you appear to be flipping from all over the place, you go here and then you're living there. Well, I mean, I'm in Copenhagen at the minute and I'm a big fan. It's, yeah. um, it's very, very chill. And if you get injured, you don't have to pay anything to get fixed again. Ah, you know, we're we're still hoping at some point in the United States that we'll be able well, I mean, to you know, not have to worry about. I think that, the but. ultimate goal would be to get paid by the United States, but live somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> they still tax you, you know. If you live somewhere yeah. else, they still tax you in America. I, yeah. I I don't care. I mean, one dollar, <laughs> one American dollar goes a lot further in a in a uh, like well, a that, third well, only country. only if you're in a yeah a third yeah, yeah right. right definitely not like Europe, yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe we'll see. it's yeah it does get expensive um yeah uh this was fucking great uh sorry if there's no swearing on the podcast no and no it's, no, it's no, an okay. explicit podcast it's explicit okay. podcast yeah. we don't really use it that much though yeah yeah but we can we do start it now to, yeah fuck yeah. <laughs> Just i don't know why up. that was thrilling this is like <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, all righty. Well, enjoy the rest of your uh, Friday night. Um, thanks again for, for talking to us, and hopefully we'll see each other soon. Cheers, guys. Speak to you soon. All right. Bye.